What is the meaning of love? How does that relate to the meaning of life? Faith, hope, love is the value system of St. Paul, and that is the subject I'll talk about today, how that can be understood as a cognitive framework, and more generally, how his understanding of love relates with my understanding with love and uh, with the understanding expressed in the Christian scriptures, uh, especially the gospel, but also the letter of uh, John, of uh, Paul, of Peter. So let's begin. I am Andres Kolekauskas. This is Math for Wisdom. And uh, I have been presenting a series of videos on the meaning of life. And in this video, I... Uh, I've already covered Plato, so now I'll turn to St. Paul. Here is the series of videos. Uh, we had an introduction, and then I talked about uh, the basic cognitive frameworks, which were the threesome, the learning cycle of taking a stand, following through, reflecting, and the foursome, which is uh, four levels of knowledge, whether, what, how, why. And these are what I call divisions of everything. Uh, basic cognitive structures um, that you'll be familiar with if you abstract away from everything, if you shut down your personal experiences uh, as given by the unconscious, which is feeding you all these answers, if you unplug uh, the conscious mind, which is asking all kinds of questions, uh, which may be leading us straight. So just uh, shut those out and you'll be left with the third mind. It's kind of like in an empty room, which would be connecting the questions and answers. But if you leave it empty, you'll see, oh, what are the frameworks by which we can connect the questions and answers? So we want to sit in that space uh, between uh, the investigatory space, where you have a question that you have not rushed to answer, but you can contemplate, and you'll take an answer when it's uh, time. So those are the basic structures. And so then uh, we'll be intertwining the threesome and foursome. We've been doing that over several episodes um, in this third part uh, because it just takes me a long time. So we did uh, in detail discuss Plato, his uh, value system, his levels of knowledge. And today we'll talk about St. Paul. And then we'll uh, next time we'll wrap it up with uh, my own uh, permutation. And... Uh, and then we'll continue onward uh, until we really have looked at the meaning of life in all these different ways. So Plato's uh, system was in, given in his uh, book, The Republic, uh, and he's talking about justice for a city-state and justice for a human soul. He's relating them. He's talking about uh, three um, different uh, castes or parts of the soul, you could say, but basically they're the, what I just said was the unconscious, conscious, and consciousness. So they all should be obedient. The conscious is like uh, in his city, it would be like the ordinary people, the farmers, the craftsmen. Uh, the, the conscious is the warrior class. Uh, they should be courageous. And then uh, also should be courageous would be the ruling class. Um, and they should all be obedient. The ruling class, the wise class, that's the consciousness that I was talking about. And so they have this virtue of wisdom, um, but it feels like beauty, you know, that they just focus on what's truly beautiful in that empty room, in that empty mind, in that world of abstractions. So with St. Paul, uh, I was thinking, you know, and this was back when I was, uh, oh, in college, <laughs> I'm 59 now, so maybe I was 22 then or so, you know, but you would think, oh, hope, faith, love, what, what is that? You know, is that a threesome or should it be a foursome or what is that? And the idea is that it's just like with Plato's value system, it's a mixture, um, it's a coloring, right? And it's a permutation. So the three colors being here, taking a stand, following through, reflecting, uh, or you could just 
what they feel like is being, doing, and thinking. And so uh, in the case of uh, believing, uh, so I'm, I'll be sometimes using believing instead of uh, faith, uh, but that's kind of like what we're thinking. And um, love is what we're doing in a sense. And hope is our situation, how we're being. That's how I read it. Uh, and there's one missing. It should be loyalty, I think. Loyalty being, uh, just like with justice, uh, kind of like an external description, uh, obeying is how we make that happen by taking it to heart. Taking it to heart, justice to say, oh, well, we should be moderate, uh, we should be temperate, uh, we should obey. Uh, we should uh, understand who should be in charge, and we should be cooperative and obedient. So believing very much has that type of taking to heart, you know, internalizing. What are we internalizing? The idea is that we're internalizing loyalty. Loyalty is how it would look like on the outside. You know, if you can't see a person's soul, well, but are they loyal, right? But if you're believing, then that loyalty has been internalized. And uh, as we go through these episodes, we'll see the framework, uh, which works to say, like, if we internalize our loyalty, which could be loyalty to God, it could be loyalty to country, it could be loyalty to institutions or our family, the ones we love, or even loyalty to ourselves, I suppose. But if we actually internalize that to say, well, we believe, then what happens is that then when we experience these, and they're like feelings, basically, like fleeting, these feelings of love, okay, that we're experiencing love. It's maybe coming through us, let's say, this love that we love, we are love, but 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 we we're on this crest, this wave of love, as opposed to hate. You know, this is a positive opposite as opposed to a negative opposite. So we have love, uh, this negation of, you know, hate, uh, uh, anger, uh, relief, depression. They come from when we expect what we don't really wish for. We don't wish for what we expect it. That just per perverts all of our emotional life. And so love is saying, no, that never happens. There is no such negation. You know, there's no such... Uh, wishing for what we don't expect. We wish, we expect what we wish for. That's the love. And so when you have that, then you get this, when it's impossible to have hate, you get this feeling, this afterglow, this kind of like, oh, it's loving, you know. We can only wish, expect what we wish for. We can only expect what we really wish for. Wow, like that's a way to... Uh, to kind of like make our universe uh, make maybe maybe it's this transcendence this feeling of wow like everything's channeled into the way it should be channeled that's fleeting uh so how do we how does that get immortalized you know you can think of this as a conversation between ourselves and god or the universe or the cosmos or fate or whatever it is but if we internalize then those fleeting feelings of love are going to be immortalized as moments of hope, okay? In the little basket of, and so I think of hope as a virtue, okay, in a technical, specific sense like this. And so let's just look at what that virtue means. Uh, virtue being that it's what makes this three cycle, the learning cycle, taking a stand, falling through, reflect, it just insist that it goes in the one direction and it only goes in that one direction. So with courage, it's saying you took a stand, but are you going to follow through? And courage says you do follow through. Okay. And honesty, which is part of uh, my value system. Like if you follow through, are you able to look at that, what you did? Well, honesty says you will look at what you did. And you think a whole lot, you know, this way, that way, maybe there's God, maybe there's not God. Uh, maybe God is good, maybe God is not good. But like, what are you, you know, what's your stand that you're going to take? Are you going to make up your mind? You know, are you going to have a hypothesis? Are you going to proceed, right? Like, so hope is saying, we will go with the hopeful. Right? We will dare to hope. Okay, we will hope. So we will take a stand. So that's that virtue. So now I will talk about uh, love. So throughout the decades, um, 
you know, I keep notes and I and I write down my thoughts and I encourage you to likewise. Um, and so there's certain questions, you know, that are just kind of asking uh, to be answered someday. And what is love is one of those questions. And you get different answers, but I think they all relate. And that's what we're doing today is relating them all. The most basic uh, that I've kind of drawn upon. And this may have come from uh, studying uh, the Gospel of John. And uh, we will be uh, after. So first, as an independent thinker, I'll tell you like what I think love is so that you would know like where the framework of wondrous wisdom is. And then we will venture off to this other culture, the culture of the Gospels of Christianity, um, which may or may not be foreign to you, but we'll be reading excerpts just like we did with Plato's Republic. So you'll want to gird your loins. Uh, I've put on my uh, shawl because it's this is a scarf because it's uh, cold <laughs> here. It's about 62 degrees, about uh, maybe, maybe 16 degrees um, Celsius. Uh, just winter time in Lithuania. We'll heat up after this. Uh, but uh, so you will want to also just kind of like say, we're going to do this. Have the virtue takes us forward. But first, uh, why don't we frame it uh, in terms of this idea? So for me, like love is support of life. And I'm, when I say for me, I mean like in the language of wondrous wisdom. Hopefully this is the language of wisdom. I'm not just telling you my personal uh, opinions. But um and so, uh, oh, but that came, I think, probably from a study of Gospel of John, um, the algebra that Jesus thinks in. Like, Gospel of John, it's like Jesus is talking to his best friend, and so you get a peek into the strange algebraic way that uh, Jesus was thinking things out. So if you think, I think algebraically, well, then meet Jesus uh, uh, different Gospels present Jesus in different uh, manners. So like Gospel of Mark is very emotional. Okay, so we will see the expectations. Uh, if you want to figure out like what was Jesus expecting and what happened when it didn't, you know, how did how did he uh, emotionally react to the Pharisees or to the demons or whatever? You know, why was he frightened? Why was he disgusted? Uh, why was he sad? Uh, why was he content? Uh, uh, because... Uh, his expectations were that uh, being one with all, right? So when you see, oh, you know, when you work backwards, you say, that's one of the kind of investigation I do. You work backwards, you say, oh, these are all generated if you understand that his expectations said, uh, we're all one, okay? So which may or may not be met in real life. I digress, but we'll come back to that. So uh, what is life? Uh, the idea is that uh, life is the fact that God is good. So God is beyond condition. And I'm usually thinking of this primordial God, like who's before logic, before, before love, before thinking, before intelligence, before people, you know, before the universe. It's okay. So there's this unconditional God. And God is good within conditions. And life is the fact that God is good. So when you have life, you have this holistic support and you have this slack that is kind of like this freedom inside the system. And they are in sync. They're in harmony, which is the topic of the meaning of life. And this is about life. So eternal life is understanding that God does not have to be good. God is more than good. Or like <laughs> the way we end up seeing that is like, you know, what's good, what seems to be good in our conditions, like... It's not about our conditions. It's about growing beyond our conditions. So in order for us to grow, things have to be often not fair, uh, maybe simply wrong, so that we would let go and we would grow and we would we would think in terms of the bigger picture, which is way beyond this, okay? And so it really, like, uh, and this will be more in the future, I'll, I'll give a talk uh, that I gave uh, in uh, Ch China on... Uh, you know, this God as the, the question, you know, is God necessary? Uh, so that's how, how do you how does this uh, primordial God motivate himself or herself? It's through this question, uh, is God necessary? Would there be God if God was not? And so God, a headstrong God, gets an idea and just does it, basically. You have to think of it in a primitive way. But so you get like a proof by contradiction. If there's a God, then there's a God. That's the spiritual world. Not too interesting. But suppose there wasn't a God. Would there still be a God? 
that's um, the physical world that we live in. There's no God, but maybe somehow God is supposed to emerge, right? If God is God, it's got to happen, supposedly. So um, that's at least the thinking of my limited imagination. But so then that makes sense of this God's point of view that, you know, God pulls away and sees what will happen. And then the idea is that God somehow emerges. God emerges as some kind of godling, you know. So that's how Christians think of Jesus is that uh, God who is manifest in the world. Um, and then um, how do they know that they're the same God, you see? There's God who understands, which means separates, kind of like separated himself out, right? There's God who comes to understand, who figures it out. Jesus figured out, hey, you're God. You know, I'm God, right? Um, and then, but how do they, how do we know they're the same God? Because they understand the same thing. So there's God who's understood. And that God who's understood is like this giant lens who takes that tiny little uh, godling and makes it equal to the big giant God, right? So the big little God says, you have to be good. You know, you're a God. God says, I don't have to be anything, but <laughs> please stop. You know, I don't know. <laughs> you know they, somehow like that. So that's how you get the Trinity. So I've explained to you the Trinity in a way I think that can make sense. This is just the nonsense in the mind. Like, you know, these are the empty chambers in the mind leave this type of argument, right? Mm -hmm. And I think it's perfectly understandable if you are willing to start with the idea that, you know, God is a state of contradiction. And then, but how do you get non-contradiction? So this is the kind of thinking that unfolds. Okay, so, and I think, so this is the theme. Um, and so what it means, um, another way of thinking about love, which is really more a theme of Jesus's, but I'm just including here. Um, and it will, so for Jesus, it's like being one with, love is being one with, okay? There's some kind of parallelism there. I don't know if I've got it exactly right, uh, but that's, You'll see for yourself. And what that can kind of mean is love is transcendent investment. Okay, so what does that mean? That means beyond all these conditions, there's this love, you know, I mean, which must be God, basically, invested in this world of conditions, invested in us in this world of conditions. That's a transcendent investment. And we feel it as love. And we feel like we feel we're part of that. That's exciting. Like that, so, the... the the God is on the side of the good, right? And uh, there, there is no hate, anger. Uh, there's no depression. There is no relief, you know, because it's just love. So um, that that uh, intervention, that transcendent investment, is what I think uh, Saint Paul will be talking about. Now, I can say from the calculations I've made, you know, but very much again inspired by this Gospel of John, but that. Love is the essence of God. And by essence, I mean, you know, of course, the core, the essential, the thing that's actually, you know, what makes God, God. Uh, but that's actually a technical term for me. It's um, the unity of the conceptions of the structure of the spirit in the spirit, in this case, is God. So love is the unity of the conceptions of the structure of God. Well, what is the structure of God? The structure of God is everything. So when God, the Spirit, removes itself, you're well off with everything. That's how everything's created, right? And then how are that conceived? What's the conceptions? Well, uh, there seem to be four, and it's wishes. So, And so these wishes are describing, you know, what it looks like from the side. This idea of God's transcendence, where like when God removes himself, I say, or herself, then where does God go? <laughs> you know, so God it doesn't have anywhere to go except for into himself. But there is no self. So God creates himself. See, so this is kind of all kind of weird. <laughs> but this is the only way I think it can happen. So, so there's this going beyond himself into himself, creating himself. And so uh, that's this notion captured by this notion of wishing. You know, so wishing for nothing means you're self-sufficient. Uh, we have bodies with needs. We don't wish for nothing. See, we're not into wishing. We have reservations. Um, but God can be self-sufficient, right? So that's before he's gotten beyond himself. That's before this proof. But then kind of gets an inkling, okay, wishes for something. God is certain. We're not certain. We have doubts uh, and we have counter questions to address those up. We have minds with doubts. You know, when you're certain, it's kind of like you don't even have a mind in a certain sense. Uh, so 
God is kind of peeking in to say, hmm, I'm going to transcend. Now the question is where to, right? Well, God wishes for anything, okay? And so uh, that means God's calm. But we're not calm. We have expectations, right? And we have feelings in response to those expectations and ways of getting done, things done to address those expectations and directions of the good. So we have hearts. Basically. We have this emotional life. And finally, uh, God doesn't just wish for every, anything, but wishes for everything. God is uh, loving. So just like parents are loving, like parents love us more than we love ourselves, uh, they are care about all the nonsense that they know it's nonsense, but you know, if we believe in it or we care about it, you know, they care about it all the more so. They take it very seriously. Okay. They 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 care about us, you know, in our nonsense people world. So um, in our little conditioned world of conditions, you know, they care. So that's this loving. So that's one way to think about loving is this wishing for everything. You know, you want it all to be, right? And so that's God who's kind of come into the world and kind of like taken over the world and saying, let it all go. <laughs> let it cut loose, right? Let it all be. So uh, the unity of all those wishes is in that love itself. Okay. It's the one that, you know, includes them all, the, the whole package. Okay. So that's to say love is the essence of God. And so you can see the growth of God through us, that God isn't just some kind of primordial God, but God gains structure. God gains conceptions. You know, God gains like a relationship with people who are looking at it from the side saying, you're wishing, man, I don't wish. You know, you wish, but through you, I could be wishing too. So how do we have that choice? Like, are we going to be into life, you know, where God does all these things for us? Or are we going to be internal life to say, we also can give up ourselves and give up our reservations and just kind of plunge into life transcendentally and be part of this transcendent investment. So that's uh, my picture of love and how it very much relates to God. Uh, and it's very much a unity, right? So in that sense, uh, th this idea of being one with, right, would make sense. Uh, and that, of course, maybe is a godly way of looking at that unity, that unity just means that being one with right? each other and being one. So those are the themes. I gave you a warning. We're going to look at the scriptures. You'll be part of the church of wondrous wisdom. This old, We'll look at a little bit of Buddha's Eightfold Way too. So it's not like 100% Christian. It'll be like maybe 95%, 96%. But let's do that episode here now. So uh, as a child, you know, even as a very young child, uh, when I was thinking I want to know everything, apply that knowledge usefully, but I thought like, you know, well, what is God? Like, what do I have to presume or whatever? Like, you know, what do I, what can I not uh, reject or what can I not uh, believe or not accept? Like, you know, if you believe in God, like, is it, uh, so what, you know, like, like, what does it mean concretely? Right. Um, and so uh, Jesus says it very clearly. Right. I don't know how I knew this as a as a young child, if it was from, but he says it right here. Like they asked him, what's the greatest commandment, right? And of course, he's versed in the Hebrew scripture in the Tanakh, in the book of Moses. And this is from, uh, the first is from Deuteronomy. He says, the greatest is, hear Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. That's from Deuteronomy. And the second is like this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Okay. So in that one, I think it's from Leviticus, the book about the priests, all the sacrifices, how they need to do them. And it all culminates into this funnel of divine intelligence. You just wonder, like, some of it such sounds so fantasy. It sounds like, uh, this is me reading it, but uh, quite disturbed a few years ago, just kind of really wrestling with the Tanakh, the Hebrew scriptures, trying to understand it, just kind of... I asked uh, uh, my friend David Katz, uh, he was a scholar of uh, the Old Testament, among many other things, uh, translating it into Lithuanian Yiddish. Litvak Yiddish. 
And hmm, it was so disturbing. I kind of just realized to look at it very critically. And so that book of Leviticus just seems like total science fiction fantasy. People who are writing hundreds and hundreds of years after these things could have ever happened, fantasizing about how these sacrifices were done. But so intently, so intently believing it because uh, they were writing for their nation to keep their nation alive under difficult circumstances. And so uh, I think they just kind of like believed. And it's like Jesus says, what you believe is what happens. And they just believed it so much. Uh, they just created. And so what happens from that? It's just, oh, it's horrible to think like, what are they making up? What are they inventing? But what happens? Well, if you believe so much, what seems to happen is that uh, among all those 20 or however many books, uh, I mean, sections in that book, of course, the sections, I guess, came later, but um, there's one that's devoted to morality of the priests because the priests have to be a very high moral standard, pure, morally pure. So what does that mean, this moral purity of the priests? And that all sums up. And then in the, there's this one line that says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Right. And so think of the morality of the priest. Maybe even I'm just thinking now, like the idea that, you know, priests are a different caste into a world. Like, it's not saying love other priests, it's saying like love your neighbor as yourself. Right? You're living among people. Don't be aloof uh, any more than you're aloof with yourself. Right? Don't be, you know, be real, okay, to your neighbor. Care about it. And then maybe just to say, um, there's the there's the uh, story that Jesus did to explain this, love your neighbor as yourself. He said, um, uh, the Good Samaritan, okay? This is a story about a person on the road who was beat up, and then, you know, all the good heroes, you know, the rabbi, whatever, they crossed on the other side of the road. They didn't help. <laughs> but this uh, ne'er-do-well, this Samaritan, this uh, kind of suspicious person was the one who helped, right? I think of it as the, uh, story of the good Scientologist, right? If a Scientologist helped you, right, what would you think? You'd be a little suspicious when they're helping me. What's going on here? Am I being... But I, I had a Scientologist who did help me when I was very difficult and I was afraid of a gang here in Lithuania, young kids uh, who were just very... seemed dangerous and mean and just destructive with property and just uh, my personal safety. And I was, I asked people to come and help. And one person came. She was a Scientologist. Uh, oh, Irena Uynitskaitė. Yes. So she passed away from cancer. That's so sad. So I think about her. But what was, um, thank you, Irena. Uh, so what was the, issue with Jesus. You see, he said it's an interesting thing. He says, they ask him, well, who is my neighbor? Right? Like, that's the conscious. Who's my neighbor? And he tells a story and then he goes, well, which one of these was the neighbor? You know, to the one who was beaten up. And they go, well, the Samaritan. And he goes, go and do likewise. But it's very ambiguous. And see, if you read it at face value, which people do not, you know, I'm trying to say, if you if if you Try reading the Bible at face value. People presume that the neighbor was the one who was beaten up and in, in the road and, you know, hurting. But he doesn't say. He goes, who was the neighbor to this person? It was the Samaritan. So it's saying, love your neighbor as yourself. Love the Samaritan. Love the one who does good to you. You see? That's what he's saying. So there's these two commandments. One is like... A, the other one is love God, right? And you can see, if you know wondrous wisdom, to, what does it mean to love God? It means those things I mentioned, the body, the mind, the heart, the will. Okay, I didn't mention the will, but, uh, you know, God is wishes for everything, is loving. We don't wish for everything. Like We have a deepest value in life, which includes all our other values, but like, we want it a little more structured than just this <laughs> mush of, you know, love in all directions at once. No, we want to kind of like uh, organize that a little bit, put some order into it, like so that we could kind of like get hands on with it. We all do that in our own lovely ways. Um, so that's fantastic. I think that's like our soul, you know, our everlasting soul is our personality is the deepest value that we gravitate towards. 
by fate, free will, etc. Mine is living by truth. You know, ask yourself what's yours. But so the idea is that the, so that's the we have wills with values. Okay. So he's saying with all your heart, with all your um, soul, maybe will, you know, with all your mind, you know, with all your strength, you know, with your body, but it's in a different order. But I think that we're on the same wavelength. We're talking the same thing. And what does he mean by love God? He's basically saying, love your enemy. If you read the Sermon on the Mount, um, he explains, look, um, everybody loves their friends, right? But if you want to follow me, if you want to be different, you got to love your enemy, right? Just like God, you have to be unconditional. Okay, if you love your enemy, that's the way you know you're unconditional, right? Like, So just like God sends sunlight on the good and the bad, God sends rain on the good and the bad. God is unconditional. God is perfect in that sense. So it goes, be perfect like your heavenly God is perfect. So it doesn't say try to be perfect. So no, be perfect. Be unconditional. Love your enemy. Right? Just start right there and then you'll everything will be fine. So you have this distinction between love your enemy, love your friend. They're both equivalent. You know, he prefers the love your enemy one, let's say, right? He prefers loving God. If you look at the Ten Commandments, there's four commandments that talk about the ways of loving God, you know, with, uh, uh, and it's the foursome, basically, right? Because, you know, uh, you know, you have one God, okay, that's whether there's a God, and then, okay, what is God? Well, there's the name of God, right? Or the image of God, those also, you know, honor that. And then there's the how, well, that's God as creator, which is the, you know, so you take a rest on the Sabbath, on the seventh day, when God took a rest from creating, you take a rest. Uh, so on, you know, the creator, God is how. And then why? Well, honor your mother and father. Well, what does that have to do with God? That's the symbol of God is your mother and father. That's how you know how to have a relationship with God is your mother and father. Uh, that's the one who loves you more than you love yourself. Okay. So, um, and then you have six pairs of those. That's a little more tricky. I won't do it here. I have to keep uh, thinking about it, but I, I did in my talk that I'll upload someday uh, is that. You can find it at mathwisdom.com. And so um, that those would be like how to not, what not to do. Do not kill. Do not lie. Do not adulter. Do not uh, uh, steal. Do not covet uh, people and do not covet things. See, and so I think that those are like six plus, and so all their negative, six pairs of those four levels. And you get 10. Four plus six is 10. So, that's what wondrous wisdom, I think, says about that. So, and maybe the crucial thing, you know, so to meditate, like to say, like, that's really like, if I just cling to these two things, I won't go astray, right? You know, loving God, loving your neighbor as yourself. But it's absolutely important, practically, like, you know, to treat other people as our equals, right? even to the point of being willing to give up our lives uh, for others. You know, that's really what we're, what we're uh, maybe called to do at any moment. You know, and that's the terms of our life, I think, you know, I think in the fine print, so to speak, or the invisible print. Um, but uh, so the relevance of Jesus, I've said, like, you know, metaphysically, this idea, there's a godling. And that godling is waiting, you know, inside of us. We're in that same situation where, like, we're the humblest vessel where God could emerge. So is it going to happen? And it basically is happening. There's a God within us. There's a God beyond us. There's this culture that wondrous wisdom is contributing to, hopefully, you know, of the spirit, which is amongst us, which is this lens that kind of relates them, you know. But the God within us, like when I go engage a gang and I look at everything from their point of view, because I don't want to get beat up, you know, and I want to look at things from my point of view, and I want them to, you know, when they call me an idiot, I want that to hurt. It's got to be super hyper flexible. So I'm just looking at everything from their point of view. I'm approaching them as a person in general. And so that is the Jesus in me. So I can show you Jesus. And in a certain sense, like when I'm talking to you as if we were the same person, as if I was talking to myself, that's me talking to Jesus, that's Jesus talking to you, that's you talking to Jesus and to me and to who. So that is godly. That's what we're trying to show. It's like, look, we can be godly, right? We are godly. Um, not all the time, maybe, but sometimes, right? Like, so let's go for that. Um, now, the crucial thing about Jesus, to give him credit, like, you know, 
I don't know anybody else who said like, love your enemy, right? We don't need uh, to be experts in translation to understand what that's about. Our minds know what to do with that statement. Like it's enemy, enemy. It's not kind of enemy. It's not frenemy. <laughs> it's, not, it's like, and you can't do that if you're an atheist, right? An atheist is just not going to have enemies if you're a good person says like, I just want, you know, go there. This is like not, it's like believing in negative numbers, you see. An atheist won't believe in negative numbers in a certain sense. You know, they just want to be positive numbers. But there's the negative numbers. Right? So, so Jesus saying, we'll take it all. God is saying, we'll take it all. We'll take the good and the bad. We'll take the positive numbers and the negative numbers. You know, we'll deal with them later. Okay. Uh, so this idea, like, so just to kind of give some respect and maybe some encouragement, like to become interested, like to read the Gospels, uh, especially starting with the Sermon on the Mount. It's just like 15 minutes, you know, to read. It's, um, I've read it maybe 30 times, you know, like it is really uh, worth reading, 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 reading. If you want to not have common wisdom, if you want to have counterintuitive wisdom, if you want to be able to think radically different, and so look away from this world and just think like, is there some other context that makes sense, not just what we're told in this world, the common knowledge, the common wisdom, which ends up being a little bit uh, dubious when you push it to the limit, because, and if you don't push, it becomes even more dubious, like, is it just selfish, right, or is it just, uh, hmm. so the crucial thing about Jesus to notice, I notice here, is like this, uh, metaphysically, like this, these two poles, that on the one hand, Jesus is the perfect person, like the godly person, you know, the one who, the one of us who was really, you know, claimed to be God, okay, just thinking radically different than we do. But on the other hand, Jesus, like love your neighbor as yourself, is the identical person. There's this an identical Jesus available in every single one of us, through whom we're all the same. And so here's this God, identical to God, and identical to each of us. And that's just profoundly amazing like you know and so in a contradiction this is like overcoming contradiction this is this is fantastic so um so we'll look at that now the more you study the bible you see like if you really studied as an independent thinker you not notice like big contradictions and jesus would point out the contradictions all the time he he only seemed to notice the contradictions so if you notice contradictions that means you're reading the bible like jesus does and so here's very popular in football stadiums and stuff. John 3, 16. What does that say? For God so loved the world that he gave his only born son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And I'm taking these from ebible.org because that's the Bible that's in the public domain. Practically every other Bible, as far as I know, is copyrighted. <laughs> so if that's what you do with the copyright, you're shackled. You know, I, uh, so it's nice to know that somebody cares to put up a public domain Bible. Thank you. And so the crucial thing, I uh, this is uh, what Jesus was explaining to Nicodemus uh, early in his ministry. But uh, the crucial thing is, so God so loved the world, you see. And we're going to now go to a much uh, more um, longer passage. But when we go that to say, like, he says, I don't pray for the world. I pray for my own. And these are father-son issues uh, that I noticed uh, when I was uh, mapping out the ways that Jesus figured things out. I thought, oh, I did it for math. I did it for my own philosophy. I thought like, oh, how did Jesus figure things out? I just did a sketch. Um, but it, it was very uh, informative because what you realize is that there's like two different ways Jesus is thinking, like in terms of the good kid and the bad kid. And Jesus was in favor of the good kid. Like if you look on the Sermon on the Mount, that was his stump speech. That was where he was saying, look, if all the good kids, you guys are good. You know, if all the good kids got around, you know, we did the good things, good kid things. We would have this kingdom of heaven, you know, where heaven is occupying earth, so to speak. We'd be, we'd be, and, and we would have this beautiful example of what life should be like. And it would just turn everyone around. It would just convert everybody. It would just be like beautiful. I think he, that's his basic picture. That's what we're trying to do with Wondrous Wisdom. Just takes a few people, like, can we get on the same wavelength? We can change the whole world, just crystallize it. We just got to figure out the right crystal that would kind of recrystallize the whole world. But God said no. Father said no. So he thought about the bad kid. 
No, we got to focus on the bad kid. You've got to, uh, you know, you've got to be uh, made an example of, right? You've got to be lifted up. Like, so, um, yeah, you're going to be made an example of, right? You're the son of man, okay? He's the son of God, and there's also the son of man. The child of God is the one who is... Um, uh, does what their parents do. The son of God, let's say, is the one who is not only does what their parents do, but is taught by them. So God teaches the son and or daughter, I think is fine. Uh, and so, uh, but the son of man is taught by man. So um, and then the way that son of man does is man teaches by making an example out of. So the son will be lifted up for everyone to see, oh, you know, you're an example of what we do to the good kid. You know, they hated Jesus because he was good. We all hate Jesus. And that's why reading these passages is hard, right? There's an objective reason for that. Like, because if someone's good, we don't want to see it, right? Like, we don't want to see it. But I'm just saying, like, uh, uh, but you know, there's a good kid in you who does practically want to know more about the good and being good and who is good, you know, who's lovely and good. And Jesus saw that. And Jesus wanted to speak to that. The father said, no. The father said, no, we need to speak to the horrible, selfish, you know, mischievous maybe is probably more accurate. The, the one who goes astray, right? The one who doesn't want to focus on what is good, but just wants to focus on, you know, board panda, or whatever, whatever, whatever else, uh, whatever, whatever the internet's offering. I know the feeling. So, you know, how to, instead of like just focusing what we're trying to do today, like focus on what's really important. So, and which is kind of exciting because it's actually, there's a lot here. Uh, so journey, journey on. Uh, so why don't we, um, oh, so then when the bad kid goes, oh, what have we done? Oh, you know, because then there's the resurrection. You see the Jesus resurrected and say, like, oh, what do we do? This is we were bad. So we were all bad. So we were saved, you know, and so we need a savior and the savior saved us. You see, so that's what the bad kid. That's like the whole uh, evangelical uh, just pick on evangelicals, but like this whole story of the formula. It's so formulaic, like, you know, oh, you have to say that you're a sinner and such and that you have to uh, uh, confess all your, you know, that's fine. Confess all your sins. But then you need a savior, right? And the savior can sell. See, but that's not what Jesus was preaching with the Sermon on the Mount. He said, and that's what that's not what Peter said. You know, Peter said, Look, I'll, I'll lay my down lay my life for you. And he goes, Nope, not gonna happen. You're gonna deny me. And he goes, Doesn't make sense. So there's another way. So we've lived for 2,000 years with this um evangelical mindset that, oh, we're the sinners, right? Like, well, we're also the good kids. And it's like, what do we want to focus on? So with all that in mind, uh, let's read um, this passage from John, um, chapter 17, one paragraph at a time. Jesus said these things, then lifting up to his eyes to heaven, he said, Father, the time has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may also glorify you. Even as you gave him authority over all flesh, so he will give eternal life to all whom you have given him. This is eternal life, that they should know you, the only true God, and him whom you sent, Jesus Christ. I glorified you on the earth. I have accomplished the work which you have given me to do. Now, Father, glorify me with your own self, with the glory which I had with you before the world existed. So, <laughs> you know, it reads like algebra. And then, of course, it just makes us wonder, like, you know, like, what is he talking about? And um, it just, it begs to be understood as nonsense um, or just kind of like to push one aside. I think like it's uh, so, but now think about all the things I've said. And so think of a God and a godling. And what does this glorify mean, Right. The glorify, I presume, means that, like, well, you have this proof by contradiction, 
the, you have the easy parts, the spiritual part, but the gloriful part is if there's no God, if God's been removed, and all of a sudden God emerges because God is God, you just can't get rid of God, right? Like, well, that's the glorification, right? That's the it's the end of the proof by contradiction. To say, well, you you can't get around it, right? So, and so then the idea is that uh, you know the time has come. Glorify your Son, okay? So that Jesus will be demonstrated to be God. Jesus will have passed all the tests. Jesus will have given up his life, you know, for this big picture, for the other people, for this love, you know, understand how you want. But so that's what this glorification is. And so now what is eternal life? That they should know you. And so one thing to think about, uh, the connection between love and knowledge in these different passages, right? Because we have these four levels of knowledge that are intertwined with the being, doing, thinking, right? And love will be this full knowledge, and then there'll be this partial knowledge, right, of believing and hoping. Uh, so this is eternal life, that they should know you, the only true God, and him whom you sent, Jesus Christ. But so who is this only true God? It's the God who does not have to be good, you see. It's the God who allows his son to die on the cross, because he says, I don't care about the good kids. We're going to start with the bad kids. And Jesus, you know, on Gethsemane, he said, uh, please take this cup away from me. You know, that's not my, he's saying basically, like, I don't want to do it this way. I want you to, I just want to be clear, like, this is how you want to do it. Like, but not my will, but your will. You see, that makes, that reading makes a lot more sense than the usual reading. The usual is like, what is he, what, what is this? Is this kind of just for me? No, it's like, father-son issues. Like, you have your way of going, you know, by way of the bad kid. And you want to do that first. But really, I just would want to do it with the good kids, right? Just take that approach. Like, let's all be good kids. But you want to do that, right? Because you love the bad kid. You love the imperfect, right? You you want to go that way. So that's your way, and you're the father. We'll start, we'll do it the way you want to do it. Okay. So eternal life is understanding that God does not have to be good. Eternal life is that they should know you, you know, see. The good kid I can understand. Like, I don't believe in Jesus because of the resurrection, right? I don't care if you resurrect or not. I believe in him because he said, love your enemy. Then I realize, well, I can't say that. <laughs> I don't think Muhammad could say that. I don't think anybody ever said that, you know. in the Leave a comment in there. Remark in the comment. Whoever said that, you know, and meant it, right? Okay, so... And again, this godling, you know, I had with you before the world existed. So before it was clear, like, you know, God, there's only God. Right? Like, God's not going to just go away because God disappeared. It's going to come out like, okay, that's my reading. I revealed your name to the people whom you have given me out of the world. They were yours and you have given them to me. They have kept your word. Now they have known that all things, whatever you have given me, are from you. For the words which you have given me, I have given to them, and they received them, and knew for sure that I came from you. They have believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I don't pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All things that are mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. I am no more in the world, but... These are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them through your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. I have kept those whom you have given me. None of them is lost except the son of destruction, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I come to you, and I say these things in the world, that they may have my joy made full in themselves. I have given them your world, your word. The world hated them because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that you would take them from the world, but that you would keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, even so I have sent them into the world. For their sakes, I sanctify myself, that they themselves also may be sanctified in truth. So it's 
the same spirit that I've been telling you, you know, that uh, we're in this world and that's what it's like to be an independent thinker. All these things are thrown on us, but independently, like, you know, we just can say, look, I know myself, I know that empty room of my consciousness, and I know that's reality. And all these impressions I get through my unconscious, they're all suspect. And all this kind of like conceptual language I build up, it's suspect. You know, it all needs to be continuously redone or maybe just completely like let go of, right? I can let go of all these things and I can be alone in the empty room and just look. And then I, I can be with God, right, in that empty room. So, um, but this idea of belief as this partial knowledge, they have believed that you sent me. This idea of being sent as saying there's this transcendence, that Jesus is an example of the transcendence of God in this world. And we are an example of our transcendence in this world if we only know, if we only pay attention. But we have that, right? Not for these only do I pray, but for those also who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one even as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. The glory which you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them, and you in me, that they may be perfected into one, that the world may know that you sent me and loved them, even as you loved me. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, be with me where I am, that they may see my glory which you have given me, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. Righteous Father, the world hasn't known you, but I knew you, and these knew that you sent me. I made known to them your name and will make it known that the love with which you loved me may be in them and I in them. And so here that parallelism between being one with and love. And this idea that the being one with is this demonstration of that transcendence. So it's so hard, you know, we struggle with this at Math for Wisdom. How can we be on the same page, right? And the, so when I push back, I say, I don't need you to understand me, right? Because if you don't have that empty room, how are you going to understand it? It's not this word or that word. It's not thinking in terms of words. It's letting go of our experiences, letting go of our um conceptual languages and just sitting in that empty room and then slowly building things up from scratch and if need to doing it again doing it until we really have grown comfortable living in that empty room in that space between questions and answers in that investigatory space so the idea is that you likewise have that investigatory space and then you tell me what you see there and i'll tell you and if we're in that same situation we should be the same jesus if we let go of all our personality, you know, and all our personal experience and all our personal language and just sit in an empty space, we're learning to live as Jesus, you know, this pure consciousness in our conditions. It's conditional. But those are the same conditions that God has entered into. Like, so God beyond doesn't have any kind of different mind, doesn't, doesn't need any kind of mind. But if in as much as God beyond participates here... It's participating, I think, through the same mind, through the same structures, the same systems. Uh, there's their universal, I think. They're one. There's one, right? There's one love. And, the, and so on different levels, that, that love, it's from beyond, but it's also, and maybe it's from within each of us, but it's also that culture of love, right? That culture of unity. So this is an earlier part Um why don't we read it, uh, and maybe I'll comment uh, paragraph by paragraph. I am the true vine, and my father is the farmer. Every branch in me that doesn't bear fruit, he takes away. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may be more, bear more fruit. You are already pruned clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Remain in me, and I in you. As the branch can't bear fruit by itself unless it remains in the vine, so neither can you unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. He who remains in me and I in him bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. If a man doesn't remain in me, he is thrown out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them, throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, you will ask whatever you desire, and it will be done for you. So with these three minds, the unconscious, conscious, consciousness, see, if it all comes from the consciousness, or like in Plato's Republic, you know, whatever comes from the rulers in terms of the setup, the beauty, 
you know, whatever fits with that beauty, that will persist. That will lead to those moments of courage, you know, that persist. So here, like likewise, the love that we have, that will give us hope in eternal life, right? If we embrace that love. So what is Jesus saying, I think, like here? Jesus is the pure God within us. And so in that chamber of consciousness, right? If we let go of our personality, it's like he says, I lay down my life and I pick it up again. If you let go of your personality and you can reconstruct it from the point of view of consciousness, that everything you live is deliberate and willful and voluntary and, and loving, uh, you know, because that's the spirit that you want to do. And, and one with everybody, not different or cut off or special, so to speak, but just the same God in the situation that you find yourself in. So then, then we are branches of that same vine that inhabits all of us, right? But you see, if we go off and live uh, without consciousness and just haphazardly, you know, just pick up all these things, do we want that to survive? Do we really want that? Like, you know, where's that leading us? Well, uh, it's very questionable, you know. And so another way to put it is like, what is hell all about? You see, it's about like cleaning by fire. Okay. So if if you want to preserve the good and destroy the bad, right? You'd like to wash away the bad, right? So you'd like to do it permanently, right? Like, how do you wash away the bad, the part that's not bearing fruit, the part that's fruitless, right? What is this bearing fruit? I'm not sure, but, um, well, certainly like good deeds uh, would probably be one thing. And the good deeds that bring testimony, right? Like to say, hey, like this God, this love, this unity is real in this world, Right? This love, this like that, that you don't have to uh, expect what you don't wish. No, expect what you wish. That's the winning side, right? Like that bearing fruit, that I think is in that sense, right? That testimony to say, hey, God has emerged in this world, right? And I see it here and I see it there. I see it in all these good deeds, okay? So... Um, but if something's just not going to bear any fruit, why do we want to have that in our lives? You know, like why, why, why have that? Uh, it's like having a withered hand. Why not just amputate it? You know, like why, why carry around, drag around some kind of withered hand? Just be happy without it, um, and just live on. You know, maybe it'll grow back. I don't know, but it's it. You know, or maybe a withered hand will grow back. I don't know. Make your own decisions. <laughs> but, but the point being that, you see, if we're attached to ourselves and all the problematic things we do, then if that's burned away, it's immortal, eternal pain, you know, like horrible hell. But if we're not attached to ourselves, it's like, good, thank you. I didn't want that, right? You you, you clean that. Thank you. Okay? In this, my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so you will be my disciples. Even as the Father has loved me, I also have loved you. Remain in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and remain in his love. I have spoken these things to you, that my joy may remain in you, and that your joy may be made full. So these commandments, uh, this relationship between God's will and our will, like this ability to not having direct communication with God, but being able to coordinate our will. And these commandments help, right? Like, I think they're helpful. We, 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 he gave us those commandments. And then he restates it, though, um, gives a new commandment. This is my commandment, that you love one another, even as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant doesn't know what his Lord does. But I've called you friends. For everything that I heard from my Father, I have made known to you. You didn't choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatever you will ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. So we'll, uh, St. Paul doesn't mention loyalty, but you can see loyalty right here in terms of the servant. He's saying, you know, you were loyal servants, but now it's not about being loyal. You believed. You have knowledge. You believe. I told you and you believed in that. right? And now you're operating based on that belief. And that just puts you on a different level than 
loyalty where you don't have to know anything. Belief, you are known, so you're my friend, I told you. And maybe you have belief, maybe you have hope. I think maybe he's trying to take them to go from belief to hope in love. You know, that, that there will be this love. But the love is kind of still kind of transcendent, you know. It's kind of a little bit beyond our minds, but at least the hope in that, right? So, um, and then um, this intimate unity, right? In knowledge, you are my friends, if you do, like, so, and to lay down your life for your friends. So uh, this is the idea of working on the inside in, that we're all, maybe like that atheist who's a good atheist, you know, to say they don't really want to have enemies, but they want to have friends. They want to treat people as their friends. Uh, and so they want to be one with their friends. They want to be friendly to people, right? So there's deep friendship, and friendship is based on knowledge, okay? That people know each other. I command these things to you, that you may love one another. If the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, since I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you. A servant is not greater than his Lord. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But they will do all these things to you for my name's sake, because they don't know him who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have had sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. He who hates me hates my father also. If I hadn't done among them the works which no one else did, they wouldn't have had sin. But now they have seen and also hated both me and my father. But this happened so that the word may be fulfilled, which was written in their law. They hated me without a cause. So um, kind of grim. Uh, and so this idea that um, we don't have to like what we read, but that's a challenge for us. Like, are we going to go out to people? But first we should kind of like give ourselves, feed ourselves fuel ourselves with this energy of oneness, of unity, of love, and then go out and seek that love in people, speak to that love in people. And he mentions a servant is not great in his Lord. I just mentioned like different gospels give different um, knowledge of Jesus. Um, and the one gospel, I forget, I think maybe it was Matthew or Luke. I think it was Matthew. Uh, talk has lots of parables. And so I asked, like, well, what is the content of those parables? What is the message? What are you trying to say? And because he kind of repeats. So there's eight contents. But, uh, and so maybe the, um, this is starting with this one. So it's basically like, um, belong to the Lord, share in the favor of your Lord. Okay. Which here's, <laughs> you belong to me and I'm getting punished. You're going to get punished too. Okay. But belong to the Lord, share in the favor of the Lord. Uh, wait for the master, share in the treasure of the master. And follow the teacher, share in the virtue of the teacher. So those are three. And then there's three more. Um, as you value the little, so you value the big. Okay, so like he's saying, like if you, if you, the way you deal in little things like money is the way you're going to deal in big things like, you know, life decisions. So they've just... Um, that's just a rule, okay? As you, um, let's see, how does it, as you value the work, so you value the worker. Another way to say it is like, you know, as you value the fruit, so you value the tree, right? He's been talking about that. And that's the scientific method in a certain sense, like, you know, judge the tree by the fruit, okay? And then finally, uh, oh, and then uh, as you value others, so are you valued. Okay, so these are about like how we're valued, how we value, what the consequences are. But there's two that are like key. And one is maybe um, like in this world, uh, it's about like with our partial knowledge, he's saying like what you believe is what happens. <laughs> I've, I've lived that, I don't know. <laughs> what is that talking about? It's hard to say, you know, because... I've, I've I've believed things very deeply and it just didn't happen, you know. Uh, I believe God told me things that didn't happen, so that's very troubling. But that's you. He's been saying that here, you know, what you believe is what happens, right? And somehow, like uh, 
our belief is changing things. And we're being changed likewise. This partial knowledge. Okay. And I think it's maybe this belief towards love. right? Belief and hope are partial knowledge towards love. But the other one is what you find is what you love. Okay? So maybe what you believe is what happens. That's, that's basically the spirit of the kingdom of heaven about the good kids. Like if we believe in this, it's going to happen. It's going to happen now. When and where will we will we get to see it? I don't know. But we're participating in it. It's happening now, right? We're living it, right? But the answer is like, what you find is what you love. That's like the father, like with the mischievous kid, like the, the lost sheep, right? It's the sheep that you found is the one that you love, the one that came home, right? It's the coin that was lost that you found, you know, that the widow invites all her friends to celebrate. Hey, I found this coin. You know, let's party. So, and so this whole tension between like, why, why am I so peripheral? Probably like, why are you so peripheral in this world? That tells you a lot about the world, right? A lot about the world. So, understand Jesus is in the same situation. He's saying that's the right situation to be in. We're we're all right. That's very reassuring. And so we want a network of the people on the margins, on the peripheries, of independent thinkers who can agree deeply, you know, a deep agreement that can spread across the network and that can connect with what is transcendent from beyond. Could be aliens, you know, could be bacteria or clouds, could be God, you know. But whatever, if, or from all the different faiths, right? But but that we're ready to hook in. It could be this econet that we're building with Jerry. When the counselors come, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth, who precedes the Father, He will testify about me. You will also testify because you have been with me from the beginning. So I think I did not shy away from some testifying there. That's why I kind of took a little bit longer, maybe then. Now, so that's from Jesus's point of view, and we'll get we'll get to Saint Paul. Um, so Jesus is telling you like from first person directly experience, and it's very strange. People think like, is was Jesus real, or like, oh, this was just invented. It's like, right? You're going to invent that? That's just um, I'm reading uh, Toni Morrison's Beloved. It's very impressive how creative she is. I've been read The Blind Assassin by um, Margaret Atwood. Very impressive. What masterful writing uh, it is. But ask them if they could have written that, that we just read, you know, just kind of like from a different planet. Now, this is a human being uh, writing, but this is that same John. Um, uh, and so this is where God is love. And I remember being in a church in the uh, south side of Chicago. There was a preacher there, and he said, uh, I'm Catholic, so um, he said, God is love. And I thought... I haven't read that in the Gospels, you know, in the Bible. Like, where is that? You know, and so I asked him afterwards, like, because the God I know, first of all, doesn't have to be good. But even before that, like, is primordial, like, is before love, you know, like, just God. Like, who put this love on God? But so he explained, uh, it's not in the Gospel. It's in the first letter of John. Um, and so let's uh, read that. Beloved... Don't believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit who confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit who doesn't confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, of whom you have heard that it comes. Now it is in the world already. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. They are of the world. Therefore, they speak of the world, and the world hears them. We are of God. He who knows God listens to us. He who is not of God doesn't listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Oh, but I think... By giving you the context and the picture, this is not so troublesome as maybe it would be, I hope. Um, first of all, so when you're dealing with me, I could be a false prophet. You know, you could be a false prophet. Uh, Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount says, you know, lots of people are going to be calling my name and saying, oh, we did this in your name and we preached in your name. We did miracles in your name. We spoke in your name. 
He goes, I don't know you. That's very humbling. I don't know. Like, I'm just careful. Like, you know, like, I told you what I think as an independent thinker. I'm telling you, like, how that helps me get a certain perspective on this, maybe unlock certain passages. If you think that that's adding, that's, I hope this is encouraging you to say, hey, if you proceed as an independent thinker, you will have a different insight. You will say, hey, I've been where he's been, right? And so one of the things is that the fleshiness of Jesus, to say he lived in the world. When he talks about poor in spirit, I know he really means skeptical. I know he means scientist, because I live in the world, and he lived in the world, and we're on the same page. Okay? So that type of thing. Like, if you don't believe, if you just believe he's a spirit, and he never got into the world, the whole myth that I've been creating just falls apart. He's from beyond the world, but he is in this world, and he was sent into this world, and that makes him God's equal. He's redoing God, but in the world. So what if he's tiny, but he's manifesting God in the world? That's just as good as being the original God. It's maybe, it's it's, it's no shame to be to be tiny in this world uh, if you're godly, and we're all kind of tiny, and we're all we're all separate, and we're not really uh, received uh, with friendship in the world a lot of times. Uh, Maybe it balances out, but we know what we're being talked about here. And again, like we can reach out to others, but that's the, but if they don't want to hear it, we know. Okay, we don't have to tell them very much. We say, look, we're trying to do another way. We we have something better. We have nothing better to do. We have something better to do. We have anything better to do. We have everything better to do. Okay, so, but again, this scientific like test the spirits, like you know, judge the tree by the fruit, like be a scientist. Beloved, let's love one another, for love is of God. And everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. He who doesn't love doesn't know God, for God is love. By this God's love was revealed in us, that God has sent his only born Son into the world that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son as the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, if God loved us in this way, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God remains in us, and his love has been perfected in us. So, again, this idea of knowledge, seeing God, that we haven't seen God, we have, don't know fully. We know partially. Uh, but we know through love. We know through the unity of love. Uh, and this is primarily being spoken to say, don't believe in people who aren't loving. Right, just realize that's not uh, that's something's not right here. What's right is loving, and so people who may seem to be outside of the community, if they're loving, they're part of the community. You know them right away. If they're not loving, there's something wrong. You know, so um, and also this special thing of like what Jesus did that okay, here's somebody who gave up their life um, in principle for all of us. And that's been done not just by Jesus, that's been done by quite a few people. And they're really uh, uh, a lesson to us that that's a calling for us. But this is also saying like, look, like we will do that when we need to, that will come. We need to live our life in their love that what would they want us to be doing? Right. Like so all the children who are hungry in Cambodia or all the people who are suffering in Gaza or or mourning their loved ones in Israel, you know, all of these uh, people throughout the world um, could be your brother or sister or friends. But what would they want us to be doing with our lives? Could we explain it to them? So we say, hey, we're trying to connect uh you know, with God, uh, we're trying to connect with absolute truth. We're trying to make sense of this world, and we're trying to not give in to this world, but kind of like uh, transcend this world uh, by, for example, letting go of ourselves. You know, cutting loose from our personal experiences and our personal languages, and just rebuilding them to be in a vine that is shareable, that can be one with others in a language that can be shared, the spiritual language of who we are. Right? Can we live through that kind of language, that kind of vine? Um, can't that kind of love, right? And so this idea that Jesus already defeated the devil. I don't need to be going around defeating the devil because I say, devil comes, I say, look, Jesus defeated you, right? Go fight Jesus, right? So same thing, like, uh, I don't have to, um, 
I, I, I need to be ready to give up my life. Like that virtue, right? I feel the love. I will have the hope that by giving up my life, I'm doing the right thing. You know, I will feel the beauty. I will have the courage to do that, right? I will feel the intimacy. I will have the honesty to understand what I need to do. That's the meaning of life, right? And so in the meanwhile, like we're proceeding, we're proceeding. And then at any moment, we'll have to switch gears. But Jesus did that. Here's this person. They let, they lost it all. They were going to lead the kingdom of heaven. They were going to invite us all into it. They were doing that. And then they had to change plans. God said, no, you're going to do this. They said, that's not my will, <laughs> but that's your will. So can we revive that plan? Can we live that plan? Can we be the kingdom of heaven? And I don't think that that's a Christian thing. I think that's just a human thing, right? Why is that not humanist? I don't know. It is. By this we know that we remain in him and he in us, because he has given of his spirit. We have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son as the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God remains in him and he in God. We know and have believed the love which God has for us. God is love. And he who remains in love remains in God, and God remains in him. In this love has been made perfect among us, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, even so we are in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear has punishment. He who fears is not made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. If a man says, I love God, and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who doesn't love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? This commandment we have from him, that he who loves God should also love his brother. Okay, and so maybe just to say, like, this confesses that Jesus, you know, all these things are being um, said here. You know the language. You can uh, see how I would talk about this. But just the idea that, you know, whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, like, I think that can be, well, that should be very difficult for people. It even it certainly is difficult for me. Like, why do I need to confess that? Like, you know, why does he need me to do that? But but um, I think it's a matter of giving testimony. It's a process, first of all. Giving testimony, like you may not have the testimony to give, right? You will be called to testify. Like, you, you know, and, and the question is like, well, what is Jesus? You may see Jesus not as a Christian Jesus. You may see Jesus as the person in general who uh, is inside your grandmother, right? Or inside your wife or husband or inside your child or inside a, a teacher or a doctor or uh, a firewoman, let's say, right? Like you see Jesus, that's maybe what Jesus is. And you just don't know how to translate that. So part of that's translation, like, you know, what is that? Uh, so I think that is fair. Like, you know, that's not about the, you know, some kind of evangelical picture Jesus. You know, I think God is bigger than that, I would hope, right? I'm willing to risk my life on that. I, I'll, I'll risk it, you know. But I think that um, to give honest testimony, like to say, hey, like, if you've managed to listen this far and to say there's something remarkable about this Jesus approach. And then to say, well, let's see where that leads or where it doesn't. But to see that. Um, and what does it mean, son of God? It means that doing what God would do, a child of God, but also taught by God. Okay. Not just doing, but also taught by God. And so if you look at Jesus, you know, like look at us, let's say. You, maybe you are a, you know, it's, I've, I, Christer said, you know, we are the creator. Okay, well, what are you creating? You know, in what sense are you the creator, right? In what sense am I the creator? Okay, let's be the co-creators, right? And who are we? You know, and the question is like, you know, is God beyond us? I would say, yes, there's a God beyond us. There's a God within us. There's a God, it's the same God. There's God amongst us. So we... How can we talk about these things? It's hard, right? We need to be interested in these things, right? And I think we need to proceed from that empty chamber. But the idea being that this 
God inside of us is drawing from God, is is uh, recognizing God beyond. I think that's an important notion, like that there is a God beyond us. We're not everything. We're not the sum of things. We're not like perfect and we're not, or or even if we're like, there's something bigger. We're, we're in conditions. There's something unconditional. But that the God within us recognizes that God, sees that God, hears from that God, is sent by that God. And they're connecting through us. We're a channel where that connection is happening. And then we can propagate that amongst us. We can all be these little vacuum tubes, you know, that are in harmony, right? Something like that. And so maybe to make it even, uh, oh, to make it a little bit more Buddhist, Here's a very cool thing from the Bible. I call it St. Peter's Keys to Heaven. But it's just like Buddha's Eightfold Way. Now, Buddha's Eightfold Way is maybe 500 years earlier, right? Maybe more. So uh, this brings to mind, I've heard like, well, was Jesus a Buddhist? or Certainly, but was St. Peter a Buddhist? Or like, was the writer of this letter a Buddhist? Um, let me read the passage. Seeing that his divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and virtue, by which he has granted to us his precious and exceedingly great promises, that through these you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world by lust. Yes, and for this very cause, adding on your part all diligence, in your faith supply moral excellence, and in moral excellence, knowledge, and in knowledge, self-control, and in self-control, perseverance, and in perseverance, prayerfulness, and in prayerfulness, brotherly affection, and in brotherly affection, love. So those are eight things. They're going from faith to love. And so uh, recall uh, faith, hope, and love, right? Hope may be related to this perseverance. So, so and more, you know, maybe self-control, I don't know, or maybe between. <laughs> um, but... Um, um, so this is a path from faith to love. So partial knowledge and this total knowledge, right? And that this is for us in our diligence. This is what we can do. You know, so God gives all these promises and God, uh, you know, is godly and etc. But God is supportive of us because we have the beginning knowledge, belief, right? Like we have the lowest form of, you know, aside from no knowledge, which would be like loyalty. Once we have belief, we can start to climb our way upwards, right? And so this is the steps that we develop in our character, the types of virtues, let's say, et cetera, that are relevant. Um, and those middle six, uh, this would be for the future. So like this is a framework uh, that I call the Eightfold Way. It has three permutations that are colored by being and doing and thinking. Uh, other versions would be like the Lord's Prayer, our, our Father who art in heaven. Uh, the Beatitudes from the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are those uh, who, well, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. They all have these eight lines. Eight lines is more than the human mind can introspect. So it's like, where did this come from? So when Buddha has the Eightfold Path, and you can see, like, he calls it, they translate it in English, a right view. Is that the same as faith? I don't you know. Could you tell the difference? I don't know. Right resolve and moral excellence. Right speech and knowledge. Is it that much different? You know, do you think that the translation is making it more or less different than it really is? Right action and self-control, right livelihood, like may wake up, may way of making a living and perseverance, right effort and prayerfulness, right mindfulness and brotherly affection, right concentration and love. So it's interesting to think, oh. Love is right concentration. But think of this God beyond conditions who's focused on the conditions. That sounds like right concentration, right? So this is wondrous wisdom is to say, don't look at the words, look at the structure. And so when you, you know, see the two sides and you see the being doing thinking in the middle and you see, you see uh, like this is a null and this is a null and they're, this would require a separate analysis, but uh, and, and I'll, I'll show you what I think about this, but I'm just saying, like, um, this is great um, for me, at least. So now we get to St. Paul, <laughs> and um, let's do it. But now we have some context, and St. Paul's is very beautiful, but you'll see it's very human, right? We've we've heard different uh, points of view 
his will be quite human in terms of what does it look like? We're strangers to love. Maybe that's like when you read uh, uh, John talking about, uh, you know, giving Jesus his prayer to God. It's like he's no stranger to love. That's it seems like he's swimming in a sea of love, you know, that he has a. Uh, he, he, he's one with the God. It's about being one with, you know, we're one with you and you're one with me. And it has this whole algebra of being loved with. So one of the things I'm investigating is the science of love. Like, what does that all work, make sense? Like, what's that unity about? What are the kinds of unity? And there's like 24 different ways of having unity. And what does that yield in terms of love? It's just hard because I'm like St. Paul, a human who looks at that and says, you know, I never thought about love. <laughs> I'm not very loving. <laughs> so uh, you may feel that way too. So let's go kind of like uh, what are the insights from this hymn to love? And then finally, we'll get to the hymn to love. You may have heard it before, but maybe you'll read it like it'll it'll resonate in ways. So love is our unity and love coheres with all. It's this total coherence, right? It's like everything is one, right? Like I said, God is one, right? And so it has that very that feel, that vibe. It has no boundaries. It just doesn't see boundaries. It's always positive, never negative. Okay? Uh, so, uh, with without love, see, my words have no meaning. Um, I am nothing despite my knowledge and faith. My actions are no use to me despite my selflessness. Like, so, without love, you're not connected to, like, what's beyond you're you're not rooted you're just floating and it's just part of this world and the logic of this world and it just doesn't it just there's no purpose in this world so it's never going to be have any meaning you know like you can sacrifice all you want those sacrifices have no point if there's nothing to be connected transcendently to where love is rooted in transcendence like in this transcendent unity in this transcendent you know that that the conditions here are from the transcendent giving itself up, removing itself. The transcendent made space for all this chaos to happen, for all this strange half order to happen. Whereas by love, we know fully, you'll say, we are known fully. We are known and we know, and so we have this different complete connection. We're connected with everything totally, okay? Uh, we are participating in that total knowledge. We know why. Okay, or and but it's not, it's maybe like past knowing, like when you know why, I guess in a certain sense it's it's happening through you. It's kind of hard to imagine, maybe even it's like but look at the video on the Yone dilemma. That's uh, you know, where you you know a person by the company they keep and they keep company with practically everybody. So love is patient, kind, love does rejoice in truth, bear all, believe all, hope in all, endure all. Love is active. I think that's, uh, and so, uh, but active in a kind of like uh, standing back way, you know, like a, like the waiters who wait for what will happen. You know, it's like supportive, you know, the supportive cast, right? Uh, Love wins uh, the award for best supporting actress or actor, artist uh, in the Oscars. Uh, and so again, like love believes all hopes also. Total knowledge can also have partial knowledge, right? Endure all, uh, this hope and all. Love is not envious, boastful, proud. Love does not behave inappropriately, seek its own way, get provoked, focus on evil, rejoice in wrong, fail. Because love is not divided. I think that love just doesn't see these things. Love is just not concerned with such things, doesn't even imagine such things. It just kind of doesn't go there at all. Love knows where to go, right? Love doesn't say, that's you, that's me. Right? So love doesn't even have that type of relationship. Ready? Let's read. You can read along with me, maybe. Or you don't have to, but read on your own. Hymn to love, that's how it's called in the Corinthians uh, first letter from St. Paul to the Corinthians, uh, chapter 13. If I speak with the languages of men and of angels but don't have love. I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but don't have love, I am nothing. 
if I give away all my goods to feed the poor, and if I give my body to be burned, but don't have love, it profits me nothing. Love is patient and is kind. Love doesn't envy. Love doesn't brag, is not proud, doesn't behave itself inappropriately, doesn't seek its own way, is not provoked, takes no account of evil, doesn't rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will be done away with. Where there are various languages, they will cease. Where there is knowledge, it will be done away with. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is complete has come, then that which is partial will be done away with. When I was a child, I spoke as a child, I felt as a child, I thought as a child. Now that I have become a man, I've put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror, dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully, even as I was also fully known. But now faith, hope, and love remain, these three, the greatest of these is love. And so this now, now we live in partial knowledge. Faith, hope, or partial knowledge. When we have total knowledge, faith, hope, it's kind of like, well, they're kind of strange because, you know, of course, God has total knowledge, but God can have partial knowledge, um, you know. So Jesus could relate to all these things, let's say, right? But St. Paul especially could relate, right? Because he's human in very much in the ways that we are. So he's saying, look, faith and hope. And in a certain sense, like, faith is maybe more important than love because faith is where we start. You know, loyalty is loyalty, shmoyalty. But it's not knowledge. But faith means you you know. You've been treated not as a servant who doesn't need to know the message that they're sending, you know, the bit of one and zero and what does it mean? Does it mean that uh, start the nuclear war or does it mean, uh, you know, free the prisoners? You're just carrying the message. You're just loyal. But when you uh, are treated as a friend, you're explained to you, you know, or, you, or you're treated as a child, uh, somebody's child, you can be explained right? You're treated as a friend. So that's belief. And then you can climb towards love, you know, where you have hope, where you actually really um, have, have that invested, maybe making, maybe, maybe it's interesting, what's the distinction between belief and hope? But so this idea that belief is thinking more, and hope is more being, right? And then love is doing, right? It's actually happening through you in love. You're part of the action of love, when you love, when I love. So and this idea that uh, this uh, thing that, okay, so this is part of our growing. you know, And God grows through us. God grows through our faith, through our hope. And that uh, love is all-encompassing. So bears all things, the good and the bad. Believes all things, the good and bad. Hopes all things, endures all things. It's not that the bad's not there. It doesn't treat it in those terms. It's treating everything unconditionally. And then to say, uh, it's interesting how he even pushes back on things that Jesus said. Like, so Jesus said, you know, if you have faith, like a mustard seed, you can move that mountain. Right? Um, and he says, you know, give everything away. You know, feed the poor, right? Or he's, you know, divide, multiply the bread. Give your body to be burned, you know, put yourself on a cross, right? Like, and St. Paul said, you know, it's not about any of those things. St. Paul is somebody who's preached for years and years with utter, utter, utter attempts to try to convert people, you know, to try to open people, right? Which in a certain sense, that's exactly what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to say, except I'm a little bit maybe more um, 
patient, maybe kind, I don't know, not so kind all the time, but I'm trying to say, look, um, we're human beings. I did this as a human being. Uh, maybe I had some lucky circumstances or whatever, but like you may be doing, you're probably doing the same thing. You can tell like, but just kind of like, let's get that same vibe going and let's make that so that other people can feel that vibe, see that vibe, leave a comment. <laughs> so, um, so he's saying that uh, it's not, it's really more, and maybe uh, Dave Gray has said like, you know, maybe Kirby has said it's like, it's the context. Love is about the context of things. Do we have a context? You can do all these things without love. You're saying there's no context for it. Love is saying there is a context. There's a reason why. You know, I didn't just give you money, right? Without any, without any love. I, just, I can give you money. I said, take this. And I do it without love, you know, to somebody, a stranger, maybe somebody I know. I said, take this money. And you're just wondering, like, is this money laundering or is this kind of like, you know, is this hiding evidence or like, what is going on here? I got money. Whereas as opposed to love saying, you know, there's a reason why it's like, I think that this money wants to work through you. Right. I think you're the right person for this money. Or you'll find the right person for that money. Right. So join through Patreon. That's my, that's my, that's my little message there. Why not? I should think of supporting people through Patreon should think about who I love and support. And so this idea that, oh, this, you know, know all mysteries and know all knowledge. So I was um, right on as a child to say, it's that's not going to give you, like, you have to apply that knowledge usefully. And you're saying like, yeah, and you can useful, you have to be careful how you define that, because if it's just useful in this world, that's not really going to be very loving. So, uh, again, the gift of prophecy, like that these things, you know, you prophecy, that's just temporary. Prophecy, and usually the greatest prophets are the ones who don't know what they're talking about. Only later do you realize that was a prophecy, like, uh, oh, that was a sign that these things were preordained. Because that person didn't know what they were talking about. But it was preordained through their words we see. And so likewise, um, knowledge, you know, knowledge is like the foursome. So you have like the zero sum, God, and the foursome. It's like thought periodicity is eightfold um, in terms of states of mind, divisions of everything. But there's the twofold in terms of complex numbers. And I think it's just basically God goes beyond into himself, into the godling, right? And then the godling reaches out back to God. And it's happening through us. There's this double channel. There's this thought periodicity, two cycle, right? Uh, it's kind of uh, simple. Uh, so that's why it's important to have a God beyond us and have a God within us so that they can communicate through us. It's the same God, but that's how that makes it interesting for us. You have all this traffic. If you know, don't block that, <laughs> show goodwill, you know, keep your heart open, allow the good heart to shine through, and, and, you know, in either, I suppose, in either way. Um, but, um, or maybe primarily from the inside. I think that's why it's called the good heart. So, um, But the knowledge you see, that's that's in the conditional world. That's like a substitute for God, right? And the idea is that you can go beyond that. Uh, you don't, you know. In the end, if you're if you're with God, you don't need knowledge, right? If God lives through you. But if if you're alone from God, then you maybe that's to say, like, love lets you live uh, distinct from God. Because you can have knowledge of God, of the context, of the why. You know why these, you know, you know why God doesn't have to be good, because that's what you need in order to have this glorification, in order to have this, uh, you know, that's what Jesus said. He goes, they go, why did this building fall on all these people in Galilee and die? It was for the glory of God, right? It's to say, uh, <laughs> so that's a, this kind of say like, well, there's this, there's this whole world, all this bad thing is happening because of part of this demonstration, like, well, is there God even when God is not? And so there would be nothing if we didn't have this demonstration. And so, um, but furthermore, like for us to be able to recognize, oh, 
it's not about this world, there's something beyond, we have to kind of like realize the disconnect. And so that's part of the horrible disconnect is that these things are happening. Our life is short. Uh, I mean, my life is rather long, but I'm certainly 59. I think I'm getting towards the end. I hope you're younger than me. Um, uh, so this idea that love is related to knowledge, you know, of 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 God, and um, that there is this wider context, you know, and and so we can through that knowledge we're part of that unity. We participate in that unity, this total knowledge. Okay, who knows? But so thinking along, maybe learning along. I have to think about that. And so I think we've gone through this. And um, so next time, maybe we'll focus more on that cognitive framework. Uh, but the gist is, is that uh, if we internalize loyalty into belief, which means that if we, even this may be self-knowledge, right? Like if we gain that self-knowledge to say, hey, uh, I can choose to be loyal, in which case I'm believing, right? And what am I b believing, though, to kind of sort it out? Like, what is it I'm believing that makes sense of all my loyalty, right? And then to start to think in terms of the master, so to speak, um, that we're serving, right? Who are we serving? Who is my master? Who am I serving? So if I internalize that, then when I feel that love from the context, when I feel, oh, there's this connection with the transcendent, you know, that uh, there's no hatred, no no anger, no uh, relief and no depression. It's all uh, it's all expecting only what we wish for, right? So when I feel that, then because I've internalized myself, I've primed myself, I've prepared myself by believing, by participating in the knowledge, by by attuning to the knowledge, and it's a matter of thinking, right? By reflecting, then when that wave of action comes then I will uh, be taking the right stand. I will, uh, in that context, I will have hope. You know, I will kind of like prepare myself to live in that action. I will take the step say, I have hope in love, right? I have all, all these hope for all these things that love can do. And so there's this conversation in the sense like, you know, and so you, you get this, uh, it's kind of like when, when people give you a chance, love gives us a chance. And then we can say what we really believe, you know, what we really, I guess it was against like, what do we expect, right? Hope is about our expectations, right? This is what I will expect. Mm -hmm. I guess belief is like part of that too, but so what's the question? What's the difference with hope and belief? It's a question. But so the hope is more of the being flavor. That's what I think. So you see, I, I have things to learn. You have things to teach me you have testimony to give or to confess but it's an ongoing process so don't be don't be too disturbed by some of these uh, sentences that we read because um it's a uh, love is an action these are words of love they're words of action that action is proceeding and so um run alongside it you know it's a jogging partner so to speak uh, travel alongside we're journeying together we're learning what they mean for each of us, different people, you know, uh, see how they resonate with us. And so next time we'll bring this all together. Plato's uh, values, uh, St. Paul's, and mine is uh, not that much to talk about, but it's the permutation of these flavors. It's kind of like uh, the theory of uh, vanilla, chocolate, strawberry. You can get to permute them in whatever order you want. Well, they have to go in the three cycles. Then we'll do more. We'll uh, talk about uh, more of these uh, values and how they're structured. We'll talk uh, in, and then we'll kind of do like a version two of this structure. Here, Paul says again, like, love is the one that knows all, like, love is the highest. But really, you know, he's talking like a human being. He's talking like someone like Plato. But really, when you think about it, when I became more bolder, you know, who was I when I was a young man trying to, um, you know, I'm not going to set. Plato straight or set St. Paul straight. But now I'm old enough, I'm going to set them straight. <laughs> Maybe I'm older than St. Paul ever was. What do I know? But uh, really, like, although it's, in the one sense, there, there is this way of looking at that. There's another way to kind of like flip it around and say, look, the love here really is very much about the feeling of love, right? And that's a feeling what, 
Okay, what are we feeling? It's kind of like coming through the unconscious, that wave of love, you know, that's the context, etc. And the structures will make, a, uh, they just kind of be much more elegant, um, but I think also much more uh, sensible in the sense it's like, why is all this happening? It's because we believe, right? We go from loyalty to belief and belief is the why. So you go from whether to why, and this is reversing the directions. Okay, and so coloring these structures reverses the directions. And so then love and then hope and belief. Um, that will be uh, for the future. Let's keep trudging on. And so we had many prayers today that we heard uh, from Jesus and uh, John and uh, Peter and St. Paul and God the Father. And if you're Christian, uh, you <laughs> may have may have wondered what is he talking about and if you're not a christian you know i congratulate you on um walking with me um so let's just pray together um for jesus uh it's christmas times approaching what's the present that we'll give to jesus so this is a present that we gave to jesus it's from you it's from me to say thank you for what a beautiful life uh and that um uh, we would like you to be part of our community, Math for Wisdom, or whatever community you have. Uh, that's uh, my prayer, and I invite you to add your prayer. Peace and love. Thank you for watching this video. Please uh, go to mathforwisdom.com or simply read the description to this video to learn how you can join our Math for Wisdom discussion group and our study groups. Thank you for liking this video, for subscribing to this YouTube channel, and for supporting Math for Wisdom through Patreon. You go to Patreon, and you sign up there. You sign up for Math for Wisdom. Very simple, very easy, done in five minutes. Go try. You'll see how easy it is.